Hello, and welcome to another lovely session of Civil Engineering with Tanya J. Laird. I am the aforementioned Tanya J. Laird. In this video, we'll be investigating the topic of moments. We'll be looking at the definition of moments, uh, and then we'll be looking at how they are calculated, especially in two-dimensional systems. And finally, we'll be discussing, we'll be discussing how uh, moments are carried within structures and within, uh, in particular, within the cross-sections of various elements. Uh, so those will be the main topics for today, and let's begin. All right, so let's begin by looking a bit at the definition of moments. And so this will be a bit of a review from statics, but uh, we'll start with the definition from statics and then move more to a uh, structural analysis point of view, especially a uh, 2D frame structural analysis point of view. So how to define a moment? Well, a moment can be defined mathematically, it can be defined um, qualitatively, you can define it a number of ways. Um, it is a, uh, now if I were to define it in words qualitatively, a written definition, I might say something like a tendency to rotate, a tendency to rotation uh, produced by a force a certain distance from an axis. So, relatively simple, we have two components for a moment. Now, I'm not talking about components in terms of x, y components, you know, uh, polar rectangular components, that sort of thing. I'm talking about uh, two uh, items that feed into moments. So again, let's look at what we need. We need a force, to have a moment, we need a force and a distance. We need a force and a distance. In other words, a force and a moment arm. Um, in other contexts, sometimes you refer to moments as torques, although we don't use those in civil and structural engineering because we are special. Okay, <laughs> anyway, so let's look at this in a little more detail mathematically, or maybe just uh, graphically here, first of all. So you have a force, some sort of force vector, and then you have a point. Or let's investigate, say, what happens if you have a variety of points. Let's look at point A, point B, and point C. And let's think about what happens when I, tr when I uh, have this force F directed uh, in relation to these various points. Now, um, first of all, in po if I try to, again, um, in terms of force, uh, if we want to have a, a force by itself is simply a tendency to, to translate rather than a tendency to rotate. In other words, if I have a force with a certain x component and a y component, that will produce the same tendency to translate in the x and y direction equally on all points A, B, and C. Um, regardless of what point, regardless of relationship between the point and the, uh, and, the, uh, and the force vector of the force that we're looking at, the tendency to translate the horizontal and vertical motion, the tendency to produce horizontal and vertical motion will be the same. However, we know that, uh, we know that from uh, mechanics or, and from statics that uh, if you have various uh, different moment arms and moment vectors, you will have uh, different tendencies to rotate. For example, C here, it looks like, C, for example, point C here, it looks like point C is directly in the line of action of uh, force vector F. Therefore, it will have zero, therefore force F will have zero moment about point C. So I could say moment about point C is zero, and then moment about point B, then if we look at point B, well, the moment at point B would just be some value uh, that we could compute with a cross product or whatever we might use. And then point A would be another moment. And if we want to calculate moments, we of course need to consider moment arms. And in statics, we, I would usually designate this as an, with an R vector, where R just simply goes from any point along the, uh, goes from the point in question to any point along the force's line of action. But again, that's a bit, oh, that should be labeled A, not C. Um, this is getting all screwy, but uh, so is the, da such is the danger of writing live on a board. Anyway, so we have our A, we have our B, et cetera. So um, now if we did want to actually calculate these, we could say that MB is equal to RB uh, crossed into F r cross f, and ma is equal to, be equal to ra crossed into f. 
and that would actually be a, a moment vector, not a simple moment. Now, again, this is basic statics. This is more theoretical than what we're going to be looking at. Um, again, uh, how you calculate these, how you determine these, uh, the R vector, your uh, line of action vector, not your line of action, your uh, moment arm vector, I should say, goes from the point that you're considering to any point along the force's line of action. And so you could take RA, so if you have a force like this, if you have some force vector, and you have some point, say point A, you could take any point, any line um, and use that as an RA. RA, 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 like so. And it doesn't matter where you apply, uh, where you take that, that line from, all that matters is that it goes some, from somewhere along, or it goes from the, the point that you want to take the moment about, in this case point A, to anywhere along the force's line of action. Now, it, it, now, if you're doing this with 3D vectors in, say, a statics class, which we won't do much of, we won't do really do much of this in structural analysis, we'll do more t 2D systems and breaking things into components and that sort of thing. But uh, in statics class, you do you work with 3D vectors, you work with a 3D force vector, a 3D uh, displacement vector, and you calculate cross products. And the cross product simply takes advantage of, uh, the cross product simply uh, t mathematically takes care of all of the, the varying, um, the variations in the uh, R vector here. So again, regardless of what vector you take, you would end up with the same MA. So maybe I could say if uh, I called this RA1, RA2, RA3, then the moment taken about with with a uh, line with a uh, moment arm vector RA1 would equal the moment arm vector RA2 would equal the moment arm of vector RA3. Simple enough. Again, regardless of where you take the, the line from, uh, all that matters is your R vector goes from the point in interest in this case, point A, or in other words, the point of rotation, uh, to any point on forces line of action. And this should look a bit familiar, again, from any point on the force's line of action. And this should hopefully look a bit familiar because um, if you want to make connections to some things we've discussed previously, this is a direct application of the principle of transmissibility. Um, you can move a force anywhere along its line of action, and it will have the same uh, effect on a point, or on a, in this case, on a rigid body. Um, you can move a force anywhere along the line of action, and uh, calculate the moment produced by it on a, produced by it on a rigid body, and it will have the, produce the exact same tendency to rotate, regardless of where you move it along its line of action. Now, um, I know this is pretty theoretical. This is pretty, uh, uh, pretty, uh, uh, pretty high conceptual here. But uh, we will be getting to something a bit more, uh, a little bit more concrete as we move through this. Also, as we look as we look at this, um, of course, the general relationship between uh, moment and moment arm length does apply. Um, as you work through the math, you can see that the the longer and just from common experience, you can see that the uh, the lar the longer the moment arm, the greater the moment will be generated. So, for example, if I have a doorway, for, for example, say I have a doorway. If I try, there's a reason we put doorknobs. Uh, you know, there's a reason we put doorknobs at the edge of the door, far from at the side of the door. Uh, far from the hinge. Imagine if you tried to have a doorknob with, a ha imagine you tried to make a door with the, uh, with the, say the hinge right here, and then you put the doorknob right here. That wouldn't work very well. And the reason that wouldn't work is because the moment arm uh, that you're applying, if you think about the moment arm from if, if the, the hinge is going to be axis of rotation, and if you're trying to, uh, if you're applying a force perpendicular to that, well, it's much more effective, it generates much more moment if you're applying that moment far away from the, uh, from the axis of rotation, say at point B here, than at point A here. So again, if you if you want to if you want to see what this would be like, if you want to get an intuitive sense of this, just try it. You know, go to a if you're in a room right now, <laughs> pause the video and go to a door and <laughs> try to open try to open or open it and try to close it by pushing uh, right near the uh, right near the hinge. You will of course find that it is very difficult to near or or even impossible. Uh, to generate enough force to open the door or to close the door in that case, I suppose. But again, um, and because the uh, 
When you try to open a door, you need to overcome the internal friction in the hinges of the door, and uh, that requires a certain minimum moment. And if you have a, if your moment arm becomes very small, that means that the force required to overcome that minimum rotational moment is very large. Again, if your moment arm is small, the force required uh, is very large. So for the same moment, you can have either a large force. Uh, for the same, uh, if you keep, if you hold moment constant, if the uh, if the moment arm decreases, then the magnitude of the force must increase. And if the force decreases to produce the same moment, the moment arm must decrease, must increase. And that's just, just uh, simply the general idea of leverage. And uh, it can, and it connects with uh, some topics even from basic physics like mechanical advantage and so on. But anyway, that's a basic theoretical discussion of what uh, moment is. All right, so next let us consider 2D moments, and especially now that you could, now what we're going to look at would work for 3D moments as well, but it's particularly uh, particularly useful in the case of two-dimensional moments. So uh, calculating 2D moments, and this is going to, again, be particularly uh, useful uh, when working with two-dimensional frames. And we are going to apply uh, one very useful uh, theor uh, theorem or theoretical approach, which you may have not have heard, may or may not have uh, been become, uh, become familiar with in the past, and that is Varignon's theorem. Now, if you are curious, you can look up the uh, history and application of it therein, or history and more precise definition uh, of Varignon's theorem. Um, I'm going to work with a very simplified definition of this, just what we need for our purposes. Um, but Varignon's theorem, uh, in practice, um, and, and it works for three-dimensional, uh, works for all uh, moment systems, both three-dimensional and two-dimensional, and I suppose maybe four-dimensional such a thing existed. I'm not sure. I assume it would, but uh, that would be an interesting proof to see if Varignon's theorem applied in four dimensions. But uh, anyway, uh, the basic idea of, Varign uh, of Varignon's theorem is that uh, the effect... Um, the effect on a body in terms of translation to, to translate the, te the tendency for translation and rotation um, of a force is equivalent uh, to the effects produced individually. by any equivalent system of forces. And this is just one way to state it. This is sort of a qualitative definition. But I think it makes more sense when explained graphically. So any equivalent system of forces. So um, for a moment, haha, trying to avoid making that joke, but cannot resist because I love stupid puns. Anyway, so an equivalent system of forces. So let's say for a moment you have a some rigid body uh, with a center of mass here perhaps that would be mo your most likely uh, if this is uh, actually if, it's, if this isn't restrained in any way then the center of mass would be your center of rotation. But let's say you have a series of forces applied to this body. Or let's say you have one force applied to this body. And I'll just call this force F, with force vector F. So I have force vector F applied to some body. And I'm curious to see what kind of, and it, let's just say that the line of action of this force does not pass through the center, uh, the center of mass, centroid, etc. And so let's say I wanted to figure out what kind of effects in terms of rotation, or if we were looking at a statics problem, we would say, uh, the we would look, be looking at what kind of reactions were required uh, to restrain this body. Um, let's say I was interested in either the tendency in the uh, again if it's a free if it's a dynamics problem we'd be looking at the rate of rotation that kind of thing rate of translation and if it's a statics problem we would be looking at uh, what forces would be required to restrain this object but anyway but even um, but ultimately uh, restraining forces are based on the same tendency to translate and tendency to rotate so for that for this discussion that's fine so. Let's say I'm interested that the effect the effects that this force has on this body. 
Well, I could go and uh, calculate, uh, you know, I could go and do a cross product, find this coordinate here and some point on the line and get the vector r and run, run, through, a cross, and run through a cross product, that would be fine. But in some cases, is, it is useful to break this force up into other equivalent forces. And this actually would work for any, seri any sum of equivalent forces, but one case where it's very easy to see why this might be useful is if you have something like this. Let's like, actually, let's say this thing was called F1, and let's say I broke it down into a very easy to see uh, set of equivalent forces, its components, its Cartesian XY coordinates. So F1 would have an F1X and an F1Y, like so. And the benefit of this now is that it, when you have something, when you have uh, components and that are in two different, uh, that are in the uh, rectangular plane, the xy plane, this in turn becomes very easy to find individual moment arms for each of these. That would be like an F1, uh, I don't know, maybe I can just call that F1 x, or maybe, no, you know, I probably should, I probably should use like, if I was going to label these, I probably should be consistent and use an R. So maybe I would have like an R, uh, the one for R1x, the R for the uh, R for uh, force one's x component, and then maybe a maybe an R1y. Although it's a little confusing in that this is a, this is a x coordinate, right? and this is an x distance rather than a y distance. But the point being, don't get too lost on the labels. All I'm trying to say is that when you break this force F down into its horizontal and vertical components, um, again, taking the, uh, trying to get the cross product of the, uh, get, getting the uh, moment of the entire thing from the cross product definition, it can be done, but it's often inconvenient. And often you'll need to break forces down into their x and y components anyway when calculating reactions. So oftentimes it's very convenient to uh, simply consider the uh, equivalent components of a force and calculate their individual moments. So again, say we have force one, uh, we have force one, and we break it into its x and y components. The tendency to rotate produced by F1 would be equal to the tendency to rotate caused by the combination of F1y and F1x. In other words, if you, if you want to find the, the moment of a force about a point, you can break a force up into its x and y components and find the moment caused by those points individually, as we'll look at in the next example. So uh, let's now look at a simple example of applying Varignon's theorem to the calculation of moments about a simple frame, or for a simple frame. So let's say we have a frame, and we'll ignore Oh, internal forces right now. I'm only concerned with a uh, basic calculation of moments. So if you're thinking ahead, this would be a statically indeterminate frame. But that's okay. We're not going to be uh, trying to find all of its reactions. All I'm going to be doing is finding uh, the, uh, the moment, uh, is using this as an example of calculating moment. So let's say we have a force, uh, something like this. Let's say we have a force of, oh, I don't know, let's say five kips, like so. So five kips, and let's say this is at an angle of, oh, oh let's do 45 degrees. No, no, I don't want to necessarily do 45 degrees because then they're going to be the same. The X and Y components are going to be the same, so let's do 30 degrees here. So it's at 30 degrees, and uh, we have this, this five kip force. And we're going to need, if we're going to need, uh, if we're going to get some moments, we're going to need some points and dimensions. So let's call these A, B, C, and D. Now I'll add a few dimensions. Let's say this is, oh, I don't know, 20 feet, 20 feet, and 12 feet. So the first thing I need to do is, so again, uh, thinking back to the definition of Varignon's theorem, the idea is that we want to break a force into its components, and oftentimes that will be convenient for this purpose of calculating moments. So, for example, um, let's see, let's just find the moment about a couple points. Uh, let's say, uh, let's just call this force F, for instance, and so all this is given 
and I want to then find, uh, let's find uh, the moment generated by force F. Uh, by force F about, say, point A. Maybe about points. Hmm. Let's do, actually, yeah, let's do A, B, and D. And D. Okay. So the first thing to do is we're going to calculate our uh, X and Y components. So uh, we have, this is at 30 degrees, so uh, Fx here, Fx will be equal to uh, 5 kips times the cosine of 30, times the cosine of 30, uh, times the cosine of 30 degrees, and Fy will be, although, uh, let's see, Fx, okay, actually, never mind, they're both in the positive direction, so I'm not going to add any negatives to them. And Fy is equal to 5 kips times the sine of 30 degrees. And I'll go ahead and calculate those. The joys of doing calculations live. So got our calculator in degree mode. We're good. 5 times the cosine of 30 degrees and 4.33 kips. So no surprise there that the horizontal force is going to be relatively large compared to the vertical. 4.33 kips. And five times the sine of thirty oh, times the sine of thirty, and that should be two point five. Yeah. Okay. So two point five kips. Or we could just remember our our uh, trigonometry and remember our thirty, sixty, ninety triangles. But uh, who has time for that? So anyway, uh, we have our x and y components. In other words, we have now um, we're now breaking this system into two, into an equivalent uh, system, or we're breaking this force into an equivalent system of two different uh, forces. So instead of this 5 kip force at 30 degrees, we're now considering it as a 4.33 kip force in this direction, the horizontal direction, combined with a upward vertical force of 2.5 kips. And again, the reason we're doing this is that this makes it a lot easier to calculate moments because all of my moment because all of my uh, moment arms are nice and will be nice and horizontal here, and so or nice horizontal or vertical will be nice and horizontal and vertical when I'm dealing with uh, forces that are in the horizontal or vertical directions. So therefore, the sum of moments about point A, for example, counterclockwise positive, sum of moments about point A. Uh, we would say that, okay, if I look at point A here, well, let's take a look. So um, point A, the X and Y component, the X component will have a moment arm of 12 feet. So that will be, uh, and it, let's see, about point A, the X component, let me just go ahead and label these here, A, B, C, and D. So about point A, the horizontal, and actually, I'll, I'll put the, the dimensions on here too for reference and 20 feet. There we go. Okay, so the horizontal component here is going to have a, will generate a negative moment about point A. So I'll put a negative sign and it's negative because it's causing a clockwise rotation about point A. So negative 4.33 kips times the moment arm length of 12 feet. And then the vertical, the vertical force about point A, well look, its line of action goes directly through point A, so it will generate no moment about point A. So we don't need to consider the vertical component uh, when calculating the moment about point A. It's simply uh, going to be negative 4.33 times uh, 12 feet. So times that out, and that is negative uh, 51.96 kips, or just 51.96, I suppose. That works fine. It would. It could, Technically, I suppose we probably should round it to like 52.0 or something, but that's fine. Okay, so now let's do the uh, sum of moments about point B. Uh, sum of moments about point B, counterclockwise positive. This marker's getting a little low, so switch to something that's hopefully a bit more visible. Uh, sum of moments about point B, and this is going to be equal to, let's see, so uh, about point B. Well, 
both of these forces, the x and the y, will have zero moment about point B because they have no moment arm about point B. In other words, both their lines of action pass directly through point B, so we'll have no moment about point B. Okay, sum of moments about, you know what, I said I didn't put C on there, but I don't want to make C feel left out. So let's go ahead and do that about point C. Well, let's look at this. In this case, the horizontal component will not, generate, will not generate a moment about point C because its line of action passes directly through point C. However, the uh, vertical component will, and it will generate a negative moment about point C because it has a tendency to create clockwise rotation about point C. So that is a 2.5 kip force uh, times a moment arm length of 20 feet. And that would then come to, let's see, 5, so 50 kips. Oh, actually, this should not be kips. My bad. That should be kip feet, if we're keeping our units straight. And this would be, uh, no, there needs to be a negative here again, because of our uh, negative tendency to rotate, uh, or our, clo our clockwise tendency to rotate. And so that will then be, yeah, if we take 2.5 times 2 is 5, times 10 is 50. So yes, negative 50 kip feet. All right, and then some moments about point D. Counterclockwise positive. Now this one will be interesting because uh, neither the X nor the Y component will have a uh, will have a zero moment arm with this one, so we'll need we will need to calculate all of them or both of them, I should say. And so this four point so and also let's consider signs. The uh, two point five kip vertical force that will cause cause a clockwise tendency to rotate about point D, so that will be negative. And the 4.33 kip horizontal force will do the same, and so both of these components will be negative. So the uh, horizontal force will have 4.33 kips, negative. Again, negative not because it's going up or down or, or right or left, but because it is clockwise rotation about point D. So negative 4.33 kips times a moment arm length of 12 feet, and then minus 2.5 kips, again taking D down, uh, taking for the, the vertical component of force F down to the closest perpendicular point, um, uh, bringing it down along its line of action, applying the principle of transmissibility to the point where it's perpendicular to D, and then taking that minimum distance, that 20 feet. So minus 2.5 kips times 20 feet. And if we go and run through that math, let's see. So negative 4.33 times 12 minus 2.5 times 20. And we get negative 101.96 kips. Oh, 96 kip feet. Negative 101.96 kip feet. All right, and that's a basic example illustrating how we can calculate uh, moments in simple 2D systems. Again, we could go a lot more in depth in terms of uh, the uh, you know theoretical uh, equations from statics. We could look uh, in depth about getting moment arm vectors, 3D moment arm vectors, etc. But I think this example uh, really illustrates the type of I think this is sort of the bare minimum that you need to have when approaching structural analysis. So make sure you're capable of um, Make sure you're capable of realizing where all these numbers come from. Make sure you're capable of breaking the force into X and Y components and using those to calculate the moment of a force uh, about at any point, simply by breaking it into, into components and considering the moments that, based on perpendicular distances of each separately. So in terms of 2D structural analysis, this really is the core application of Varignon's theorem. And I would think, I think this is a foundational skill um, this foundational method, uh, and again, this is this does come from statics, but we are reviewing a bit. But I'm reviewing just the parts that I think are the most important um, before, as we go into later, more advanced structural analysis techniques. All right. Next, I would like to review a bit about sign convention, and this does come from statics and from basic mechanics. So very quickly, let's review sign convention. Sign convention. Okay, this is going to be relatively quick. Just a quick review of, okay, so in terms of positive and negative moments that we looked at previously, clockwise being uh, negative, uh, positive being counterclockwise, that is in very general terms when you're talking about uh, moments in an arbitrary two-dimensional space, especially external moments about a structure uh, or about a point. 
Now, um, when we start talking about a uh, sign convention for this type of moment, though, we're looking at, I'm looking specifically at the internal bending moment inside beams. And so if we have, if we have a beam and we go and apply some force to it, we'll produce some tendency to bending, some flexure in this beam. So it's going to experience some sort of deformed shape. And the exact nature and uh, size and, and direction of that shape will be depending on its support conditions as well as the its internal uh, properties, such as its internal moment of inertia, its uh, modulus elasticity, and et cetera, and the actual properties of the load that are being applied. And we'll look at that more in greater depth when we look at uh, actually calculating uh, shear and moment diagrams and uh, calculating deflection in beams. But anyway, um, I just did, I just wanted to mention briefly our sign convention. Now we saw last time that for shear, a positive shear was anything that caused our element to have a downward arrow on the right side and an upward arrow on the left side. And that is a positive shear state. Again, a positive shear state. And then positive moment. Well, positive moment's a little easier to see why it's positive moment. Um, we simply define positive bending as this type of bending here. And if you want to remember it, the uh, classic thing to do is to think of a smiley face. Uh, smiley face bending is positive bending. Now, if you want a more, uh, if you want a more uh, realistic def or m maybe more realistic is the right, is the wrong word, or more a uh, practical definition of why that is, uh, or reasonable definition of for why this is positive bending. Realize all of this is simply sign conventions. We could design our building. We could, um, when we're designing buildings, we could choose anything we want to be uh, positive or negative. That's com it's completely arbitrary. We do, we do, however, to make the mathematics work, need to choose something for positive and something for negative. And if you think of most beams, like think of buildings, think of how we design the gravity uh, support system in a building. If you have a beam, if you have some columns, for example, and you have beams, and they are under load, they are going to tend to deflect in this direction. Now, you of course can get beams bending in the opposite direction, that's negative bending. You know, for example, if you have a cantilever, uh, this is going, to is, is going to deflect in negative bending like this. It's a negative uh, bending shape, or a you could say a concave down shape. But uh, it is simply a, but, but in, terms of in terms of design and actual engineering practice, think about which of these you're going to encounter more often. Yes, you do sometimes have cantilever beams and you do sometimes have continuous beams that there are regions you have to consider uh, negative moment. But by and large, uh, positive bending is more common than negative bending. So uh, whoever, uh, I'm not actually sure when in, when in history uh, someone decided what positive and negative bending are, but at some point someone did and they just realized that um, positive bending is uh, this type of bending where it's a concave up type of bending. Uh, that is more, com uh, more common than the opposite. So that is why we refer to this as positive bending. So if a beam is deflecting in a smiley face shape or concave up, if you prefer a more uh, mathematical term, uh, then we refer to this as positive bending. And if we have a frowny face beam, or if you prefer a more mathematical term, a concave down beam, we refer to this as negative bending. So, and this, we'll need these definitions when we work through the calculation of shear and moment diagrams and functions. Finally, I would like to briefly consider how moment is carried within beams. So, not looking at sign convention, but just internal moment. And this is a bit of a review from mechanics. And we're going to be looking at uh, stresses and strains here. So, internal moment, how that is carried in terms of stresses and strains. So, again, let's say we have a certain moment applied to a section. And, so we have some cross-section. I'll go ahead and draw this as, say, an eye beam very common uh, eye shape is a very common shape for beams, and we will discuss why here. So let's say you have a certain moment, certain internal bending moment that this section needs to be able to resist. How is that, uh, and so in order to resist this moment, we need to have uh, some sort of internal moment that will balance the external moment that is being applied to this beam. And so how do we do that? Well, ultimately we need to, again, thinking back to the definition of moment, we need forces separated by a distance. And so assuming things are uh, elastic, remain elastic, you have, you start by having a, a certain steering distribution. 
a certain positive or negative strain distribution, so a certain strain distribution. And I'm going to, again, I'm going to be going through this relatively quickly, um, but just this is a review from basic mechanics. Um, you have a certain strain distribution. And then, uh, assuming everything is, is elastic, you'll also have a certain stress distribution. Now, if everything is elastic, then the uh, stress distribution will be directly proportional to the strain distribution, um, related, of course, by the moment of an, uh, by the modulus of elasticity. Then, in turn, with these stresses, and then these stresses applied over certain areas, you get certain forces. And maybe if I want to do this properly, I could show, show this like this. Again, stress is multiplied over, integrated over the areas where they calculate, where they're applied. You get a certain force, a certain force, separated by a certain distance, d, and then from those you have a for, you have two forces separated by a distance, and from then you get from there you get moment. Again, you would get moment is equal to force times distance, and assuming again assuming this is elastic. Now, if uh, if you're looking at basic stress. If you want to do a basic stress calculation, assuming everything is remaining elastic, uh, elastic bending stress. Well, the elastic bending stress will say uh, if you have a sigma, an elastic bending stress, that would be equal to mc over i, where um, Again, this is the this would be and when I say elastic bending stress, I mean the maximum stress that occurs anywhere inside the section of a beam, assuming that this is elastic. Is assuming that you're and by by assuming elastic, what I'm saying is I'm assuming that the stress remains below the yield stress of the material, and so M would be your moment applied to your section, the the, or the maximum moment or the moment applied at a given location in a beam. C is the distance from the uh, centroid, or the, actually I should say the neutral axis, to the outermost fiber, and I, of course, is your moment of inertia. So, and then you would often set, you might set, the, in terms of design, you might set that less than or equal to your yield stress, for example. Now, I is going to be very important, because we see that I, it rep, I basically represents a, uh, a cross section's geo it's a, it is a geometric property of a cross section, and it is the it represents the ability of a cross section to resist moment. So again, I is critical. The mo I the moment of inertia uh, represents a critical uh, property of a cross section. It is fun now we could look at the definition of it, but in term but qualitatively or at least in this application, it represents a cross section's ability to resist moment. And if you look at the mathematical definition, how do we produce a large moment of inertia? Well, if you want to produce a large moment of inertia, you do that by having, if you want a large moment of inertia here, let's get a different color. If you want a large moment of inertia to get a large I, you want area far from centroid or the neutral axis. So if you want to maximize the amount of area, the amount of moment of inertia for a given amount of uh, cross-sectional area, you want that area to be as far away from the centroid of a beam, uh, or the centroid or, or the neutral axis of your beam as possible. And this fundamentally explains the operation of a W section or an I shape. Um, this is why we make beams like this. We try when designing a beam, uh, when optimizing a, a section. We, now we, again, we could make a shape. We could make a cross section in any shape we want. We can you have circles. We could have we could have solid tubes. We could have solid squares. We could have hollow tubes and square hollow tubes. And we could you make a we could make a literal W shaped beam, like literally shaped like a W, if we wanted to. Although there wouldn't really be much point, and that'd be a terribly impractical beam. But uh, the reason I-shaped beams or W-shaped beams are shaped the way they are is that we are fundamentally trying to, uh, trying to uh, 
put as much area as, po as possible as far away from the centroid as possible. And so as we saw last time um, when, did, when discussing shear, that the web of a W section primarily carries your shear, the flanges of a W or I-shaped shape, I section uh, carry your moment. And this fundamentally is what is responsible for this one property, the property of maximizing moment of inertia, is, for, it is what is fundamentally responsible for the design of W sections and similar sections. So again, um, you can look through, you can review a bit more mechanics if you're curious about uh, calculating some of this, and we will be uh, going back to some of these topics as we work through the course. But again, just be aware of how moment is carried internally, how ultimately you can build from uh, strain to stress to forces, and you can also calculate elastic and inelastic uh, maximum uh, flexural uh, stress, maximum bending stress. And finally, be aware of uh, how uh, moment of inertia represents a, uh, a cross-sections uh, ability to resist moment, and to get a large moment of inertia, what you need is to maximize the amount of area as far away from the centroid as possible. All right, that'll do it for today. Again, in this video, we just looked at moment. We looked at the definition of moment. Uh, we looked at what is required to produce a moment, both a force and a uh, distance or moment arm from a point of uh, rotation. We considered certain ways of, uh, of facilitating and easing the calculation of moments, in, particularly apl in particular applying Varignon's theorem uh, to the quick calculation of moments in two-dimensional systems, about two-dimensional frames, etc. Uh, then we looked at uh, the definition of positive and negative moment in terms of internal moment in beams. And finally, we considered uh, how, uh, how moment is carried internally in beams and sections, uh, looking how it builds up from uh, strains to stresses to forces, and ultimately the moment that is carried by a section, and why we use W shape sections, uh, why we use those typically if we want a shape that is optimized to carry moment. Anyway, please let me know if you have any questions or thoughts. Feel free to leave them in the comments below or reach out to me via email. Uh, if you have any uh, questions or comments or thoughts, uh, please leave them there again. Uh, like, comment, and subscribe to make the uh, YouTube uh, robots happy, lovely. <laughs> um, anyway, if not, our, our next video will be uh, our first video looking at uh, the beginnings of investigating and discussing uh, shear and moment diagrams and shear and moment functions. But for now, this will conclude our sort of uh, three video series introducing internal forces. We looked at, uh, we had one video on axial forces, one video on shear, and now we have uh, our final one in this mini series uh, looking at moment. And again, these are just meant to be brief introductions to these forces before we start looking at more complex frame analysis. All right, again, feel free to let me know if you have any questions or comments. Uh, regardless, I hope to see you all again soon in the next lecture. I look forward to seeing you all then. And as always, thank you.